Good afternoon. We are here at the IW Nonochkin Lymphoma 2019 in Boston, and we just uh, finished uh, a session that was focused uh, on the tumor microenvironment and its role in lymphomas. I'm here with uh, two of the speakers, uh, Dr. Robert Creedell from uh, the Ontario Princess Margaret uh, uh, Research Institute and uh, Nathan Fowler from the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And we are going to just briefly discuss uh, and highlight uh, what uh, emerged from this, uh, from this interesting presentation. There's been a significant interest uh, and there's definitely emerging uh, new evidence for the role and the importance of targeting the microenvironment. So Robert, uh, can you tell us uh, what we learned uh, and what are the future directions uh, in the context of follicular lymphoma? Yeah, so I was uh, focusing mostly on follicular lymphoma. And in this disease for a really long time, we've known that uh, the composition of the normal microenvironment is really critical for survival. And uh, more and more, I think we, we kind of try to um, leverage the microenvironment for, for therapeutic purposes. And uh, at the same time, we also do realize that uh, in particular non-Hodgkin lymphoma's uh, responses to at least single agent uh, immunotherapies such as CHEK1 inhibitors may not be quite as good as we would hope them to be. So I was really, uh, for follicular lymphoma specifically, reviewing um, some of the insights related to how actually novel um, gene mutations that were recently described over the last uh, five to 10 years actually kind of shaped the tumor mic environment. And if I am um, just to maybe highlight a couple. So for example, we've learned that mutations in a gene called uh, TNFR14 or HFAM uh, seem to really uh, be quite critical to kind of activate uh, the immune stroma and also T cells in this disease. And uh, similarly, we also found that um, mutations in a gene called uh, CREPP, which is an epigenetic modifier, seem to be really quite critical to um, downregulate uh, MHC class two expression in this disease. So I think more and more we actually are beginning to understand the kind of very close interactions between the genetics of the tumor as well as the microenvironment composition. And uh, potentially this in the future could actually give rise to um, novel kind of combination strategies. And in particular, I think um, uh, there's some very early data that is emerging suggesting that maybe combining epigenetic therapies with uh, therapies that are looking more so at the immune microenvironment may be a promising way forward. So. That was kind of in a nutshell what, I, what uh, I was trying to talk about. And maybe uh, following on, on these topics, uh, in, we heard from Nathan that there can be possibly a large set of players uh, that could be targeted yeah. within the microenvironment. Uh, so is there anything we learned also from other type of cancers so sure. that, uh, that could guide so, us? So, you know, I talked about how, and I think Robert said very well that um, Unfortunately, the way, although we think we kind of understand the way these drugs work, they don't work in the majority of lymphomas. Uh, they work in a very small, well, a large set of Hodgkin's lymphomas, probably a small set of folliculars, and occasionally in large cell lymphomas. And we don't really quite uh, understand why that is. We know that some of these lymphomas, like follicular lymphoma, are really driven by changes within the microenvironment, yet targeting specific aspects of the microenvironment largely has been unsuccessful using these drugs as single agents. Things like pembrolizumab by itself has only around 9% response rate in follicular lymphoma. So yeah, I talked a little bit about some of the things they're doing in the solid tumor world, uh, either using uh, different types of techniques to kind of normalize the tumor vasculature, potentially hitting uh, some of these other immune cells within the microenvironment like T regulatory cells, macrophages, or MDSCs, these myeloid deprived suppressor cells could potentially be a way that we can overcome some of these you know, mechanisms of resistance uh, to immuno-oncology drugs in lymphoma. Unfortunately, you know, these uh, trials, or I should say these combinations, have not really been explored much in lymphoma. And we had a question from the audience about, you know, uh, what can we do further to kind of build further uh, maybe translational studies to help understand how these will work. And at least today, uh, we have not yet seen a lot of that. I hope you know, there are some of these things that are ongoing, but publicly there have been very, very few things published uh, that have helped us understand how to combine these drugs into the next generation of, of treatments. 
So how would you envisage designing a clinical trial given the yeah. heterogeneity of this? Procedure? So this is very tough uh, because at least, uh, for example, in, in low-grade lymphomas, it's been very difficult to develop animal models that can uh, mimic what's happening in humans with regards to the immune microenvironment. Uh, we have seen uh, some PDX models that are being used, and some of these PDX models uh, are replicating some of the, the same immune systems that we see in humans. But uh, so far, it's, I, okay, the, the answer, the question is how do we create a model that can help us predict um, what's the next combination? At least to date, it's been somewhat tough. I think ultimately we need to develop animal models that mimic what's happening in the immune microenvironment. And, and as you probably know, there have some mouse models where they're using uh, NK cells which are infused into mice, or there are some now uh, mouse models where we're looking at de novo lymphomas that occur in the mouse uh, that hopefully, you know, mimics the microenvironment of humans because this mouse has a intact microenvironment. That, I think, is really, using those kind of models, I think, is the only really way we can test these combinations. These combinations you can't test in cell lines, for example, because they just don't have the, uh, the uh, benign environment that uh, is probably responsible for why these drugs work. So that's a long answer to your question. I think that building immunocompetent animal models is probably the best hope, but it's, uh, I think, still very early. Maybe challenging, too, yeah. because of the different composition. Uh, well, um, going back to maybe uh, the follicular lymphoma and, and particularly uh, looking at the events that lead to its transformation to the more aggressive uh, tumors, uh, we have gathered uh, a number of data that would suggest maybe these tumors uh, tend to uh, be selected or select uh, alterations that may favor evasion from immune surveillance and that uh, may be parallel to the observation that a loss of MHC class 1, for instance, is uh, frequently associated with more aggressive lymphomas. So can you maybe uh, tell us a bit more about what we learned and, uh, and what you think? Yeah. I think certainly what we've learned is that uh, alterations in MHC class 1, in particular B2M uh, alterations, I think is really work that you have uh, produced and uh, we have uh, seen as well. Um, these are really quite typical of aggressive lymphoma rather than indolent lymphomas. And even in patients in whom we have kind of these serial specimens, we can see that these mutations appear to be acquired over time and then be associated with quite aggressive disease behavior. It's uh, somewhat tempting to speculate that maybe these alterations by themselves could contribute to the lack of efficacy of immune checkpoint inhibition in, in large cell lymphoma in particular. But then on the other hand, as we've seen from uh, the talks this morning, especially Dr. Zelenis' talk, um, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma is kind of the paradigm in which these uh, molecules uh, work the best, yet Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells often actually um, lack uh, the expression of some of these molecules. They also commonly have B2M mutations. So um, the explanations may not be, may not be quite, that, quite that simple. But um, at least I think this kind of provides the background to, I think, uh, build uh, some of these translational tools into clinical trials and try to understand um, uh, probably in part retrospectively why certain responses were seen in patients and whether some of these responses are tied to certain aspects of the immune microenvironment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Robert, I mean, we, had, we heard a case today about uh, a, a patient that had responded to checkpoint inhibition, stopped, and then over time regained the sensitivity. And I'm just wondering, you know, are some of these changes, like with MHC class 1, dynamic? And uh, could there actually be regain of, of expression over time? Yeah, I, I think we, um, we really lack, I think, the collection of uh, larger cohorts of patients who have been serially profiled. It's sometimes quite challenging to do repeat tissue biopsies in patients, especially like on, on protocol and trial when there's not really a clear connection to a, a treatment uh, decision. Um, so um, uh, much of the data set that we will need is, is kind of lacking. Uh, yet we know for sure that uh, in lymphoma as well in many other diseases that there are these clonal tides and uh, if you give different selective pressures on, on a tumor then the genetic composition may change and if you do think that uh, some of the microenvironment changes are linked to some of these mutations then you would suppose that uh, probably some of the immune background may also change over time. Yeah, very cool. So maybe 
studies that would focus on smaller populations within the tumor as well as the tumor microenvironment uh, may help us yeah. elucidate and these. And serial biopsies, which has been really hard so far at least to, to obtain. But. Thank you very much. So we have lots of work ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.